Hello, everyone. Let's begin the class. Um, before we begin, thanks for making all the way here. It's almost end of the semester. Good job. You guys are almost done. Just a few more classes and we'll be taking the final and that'll be it. Um, of course, as always, I'm going to start by taking attendance. I will pick five random people. And if you're here, just type in the chat that you're present, your name, whatever. Okay. Um, first is Michael. Are you here? Okay, great. I see your name. Perfect. Um, Patricia. Okay, uh, Patricia. Okay, seems as though she's not here. All right. Um, Jenny. Okay, I see you. Great. Perfect. Uh, Mina. I see you too. And let's see. Uh, Tasu. Great. You guys are all here. Except for Patricia, hopefully come in later. And of course, um, I want to make one single announcement before we actually begin with the material. Uh, we will have one final quiz next class, okay? I know it's not the greatest news for you guys, but we will have one final quiz. It'll be a simple multiple choice on the stuff that we learned today. So make sure that you guys study. All the lecture material will be on KLMS, all right? Okay, so let's begin. As you guys can see, today's topic is astronomy. Um, it's one of my greatest passions and I really love this topic. So hopefully you guys will find some interest in astronomy after this class. Okay, so let's begin by defining astronomy. So what exactly is astronomy? You guys all heard of it, I'm sure. Um, so you guys probably think about stars and planets and moons and keywords like dark matter and asteroids and all, all these things. And it's true, astronomy is a study of all these different types of beings and things in the universe. But it's also really difficult to define what astronomy is because it combines physics, engineering, mathematics, chemistry, and yes, even biology to a certain extent in order to study exactly what's happening in this gigantic universe that we're in. But if I were to boil it down to a single sentence, I think it would be it explains the world and its various phenomena with physical laws that are explainable. So the key part here is that it's physical laws that are explainable. So in order to explore this, we're going to go into several different laws that have been discovered throughout history to sort of show you the development of astronomy and what kind of important physical laws are crucial to understanding the different phenomena that's happening in the universe. So, so in order to delve into this topic, I just want, want to give you guys sort of a glimpse into how astronomers really think about this topic. So I like to compare it to searching the black box, aka it's sort of like a child putting their hand into a box and just searching around trying to see exactly what's in there. But all you have is your senses, right? You don't get to actually see it because a lot of astronomy isn't done in the visible spectrum. A lot of different things such as, as we said before, dark energy, dark matter aren't visible. So how do we detect these things and how do we ever define them? So it's really all a, a lot about looking for patterns um, and thinking even just beyond the current dimension or just, just the things we can observe. For example, what would 5D look like? And here is a quote that I really love from a British astro astrophysicist, Martin Rees. He said that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So what it means is that basically just because you can't see it doesn't mean that you can conclude that it's not happening. It also means that just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's always what you think it is. But astronomers have to be very careful when determining or making assumptions because there's so many things and so much information that we might be missing out on. And to sort of give you a glimpse into what we'll be talking about today, I'm going to show you a brief, brief clip from Interstellar. It's one of my favorite movies, and I know it's not 
a hundred percent the most accurate, uh, scientifically accurate film out there. But I just really love the message and the sort of the setting behind it. So I'm gonna show you guys a clip that shows a hint of what kind of topic we'll be delving into today. So I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment and show you guys this clip. So the lost communications came through. How? The relay on this side cached them. The years of basic data, no real surprises. Miller's side has kept pinging thumbs up, as has Dr. Mann's. Um, Edmonds went down three years ago. Transmitter failure? Maybe. He was sending the thumbs up right until it went dark. But Miller still looks good, though, right? She's coming up fast. Mm -hmm. There's one complication. The planet is much closer to Gargantua than we thought. Gargantua. It's what we're calling them, the black hole. Miller's and Dr. Mann's planets both orbit it. And Miller's is, is on the horizon? Well, it's a basketball around the hoop. Landing there takes us dangerously close, and the black hole that big has a huge gravitational pull. Look, I, I, I could swing around that neutron star with you, sir. No, 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 it's not that. It's time. The gravity on that planet will slow our clock compared to Earth's drastically. Well, how bad? Well, every hour we spend on that planet will be seven years back on Earth. That's relativity, folks. Okay, so uh, I'm not sure if you guys actually heard the clip. It was a little bit quieter than I liked, but the key line is at the very end. That's relativity, relativity folks. So I'm not sure if, if you guys can get the hint, but yes, we'll be talking about relativity today and about all these fascinating laws that govern how time and light uh, and space functions in the universe. So if you guys haven't seen the movie, I personally like it. Please go watch it. Um, it's on Netflix, on all these different platforms. So it's really a fun watch if you guys are interested. So let's sort of start from the beginning. The start of what you might consider an actual physical law that is part of astronomy. So you guys have all for sure learned this in physics, of course. It's the Newton's law of universal gravitation. So the most famous physical law, I would say, is Newton's second law of motion, right? Force equals mass times acceleration, F equals ma. And basically gravity, according to Newton, is just a simply a force upon an object. It is a force created by the massive uh, mass of a planet upon another planet. So uh, Newton hypothesized that the force of the gravitational attraction between two objects, of course, not just planets, any two objects, is inversely proportional to the distance that separate the centers of the two objects. So on the figure here, you can see M1 and M2. So they each exert force upon each other. And this force is given by the equation g, which is the gravitational constant, times m1 plus m2, the two masses, divided by r squared. And the reason why, for example, a star seems to be staying still while a planet moves around is because for the star, its mass is going to be way bigger than the planet's, which is why it feels like it's not moving. So this is one of the most basic laws, and you guys all know this, I'm sure. So I'm going to sort of go beyond this and expand upon Newton's simple classical law of universal gravitation. So here we're going to delve into three very important laws by Kepler. Kepler is another uh, very well-known astronomer. And he discovered these laws with very simple uh, tools and telescopes that were not as advanced as ours, obviously, today. And yet he still were able to make these conclusions by just simply observing the movement of the planets in the sky. So um, I just want to make sure that you guys know that these are very important and to pay attention during this part. Okay, 
So Kepler's first law is called the law of ellipses. So what does law of ellipses state? It basically says that all planets move about the sun or any star, truly, in elliptical orbits. And it has the sun as one of the foci. So there are two important parts, right? First part, elliptical orbits. So it's not perfectly circular. Or it could be perfectly circular. And that is what a lot of the ancient astronomers who really strive for perfection wanted it to be. But in reality, a lot of times it's elliptical. It is not as exaggerated as the one in the figure, for example, but it is elliptical, meaning it is not a perfect circle. And the sun has to be at one of the foci, uh, which is on the major axis. So because it's an elliptical uh, shape, the planet will have a place that where it's closest to the sun called the perihelion, and a point where it's the farthest away from the sun called the aphelion. So what is the second law? I personally think this is one of the cool, uh, the coolest law out of the three. It's called the law of equal areas. And as the name suggests, it all it states is that basically as the planet or any object goes around another object, the radius vector, meaning uh, the vector from the center to where the planet is, joining any planet to the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal lengths of time. So as you can see here, if you were to say count 10 minutes of a planet orbiting the sun, the area created by the two radius vectors and the parameter will be the same uh, based on the time measured. So if you're to measure 10 minutes, no matter where it is, the area will be the same, which is very, very not quite intuitive and yet very cool. And Kepler's third law, uh, this will be on the test. I just want you guys to know that this is going to be on the test, on the finals, so that you guys will have to make sure to study this, all right? You have to memorize the equation as it is, and make sure to understand what it's saying, okay? So Kepler's third law is called the law of harmony. What does that mean? It states that the squares of the periods of revolution of the planets are directly proportional to cubes of their mean distances from the sun. So let's break this down, okay? So the period of revolution, cool. How long it takes for a planet to circle the sun. For us, the Earth is 365 days, right? Earth days, obviously. So the square of that is equal to, as given here, four pi squared over the gravitational constant times m1 plus m2. So again, we see Newton's gravitational uh, law of universal gravitation coming through times the cube of the mean distance. So what is the mean distance? It's going to be the semi-major axis. So we saw the major axis and it's half of that. So this equation describes a very important relationship between the period and the mean distance. And the reason why this is so important is because it allows us to calculate the distance and a lot of different characteristics of the objects that we see in the sky. So here I'm gonna give you guys a brief uh, fun problem for you guys to solve right now, okay? It's a simple activity that you guys can do. So uh, the problem here states that the planet Mercury travels around the sun with a mean orbital radius of 5.8 times 10 to the 10th meter. The mass of the sun is 1.99 times 10 to the 30th uh, kilograms. Use Kepler's third law to determine how long it takes for Mercury to orbit the sun. And please give your answer in Earth days. So I'm going to give you guys around a minute or so to solve this and post it on the chat whenever you guys get it. Um, obviously, it's a simple, very simple plug um, and using the equation. So I don't think you guys are going to have too much of a trouble with it, but it might take some time to actually calculate. So I'm going to give you guys around 40 more seconds and you guys can try to solve this in time. And as I mentioned before, Please remember that this is a very important concept, okay? I'm going to need you guys to pay attention for at least this third law, because this is definitely, definitely going to be on your test. All right, I'm going to give you guys 15 more seconds. See if you guys can solve it. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. All right, so let's see if anyone has got it. 
Okay, I see some answers. Uh, I see 60 days. That is definitely not correct, unfortunately. I'm not sure what happened there. Maybe some calculation mishap. Oh, yes, someone got it. Okay, yes, it is 88 days. All right, if you guys are not quite sure, try it again. You guys can try to get it. It's 88 Earth days. Okay, great. You guys are grasping the concept, which I'm very happy about. Okay, uh, now let's get into sort of more recent discoveries. So again, this is something that you guys all heard of, your relativity, and it relates back to the clip we saw at the beginning, right? So what is theory of relativity? We hear it all the time. It is sort of a MacGuffin, I shall say, in a lot of diff different movies, they use it to justify a lot of interesting things happening. So, um, so Einstein, of course, as you can see in the picture here, basically came up with two different theories of relativity, the general and special relativity. And the special relativity especially uh, states that sp space and time are interwoven. So instead of thinking of them as two different things, like say space stone you know, and time stone, it's actually interwoven and they are known as space-time. It's called the space-time continuum, the fabric of space-time, etc., etc. And because of that, that's why you see time dilations and um, like length distortions and things like that. And basically, these theories transform our understanding from a Galilean, which is the very classical version, to Lorentz, transformations. You guys heard of Maxwell equations, right? This is what, that's what Lorentz uh, transformations sort of relate to. So while I really want to delve into it, we're a little bit limited in time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to link you guys uh, a link to a video that really explains it very well in a short, easy to understand manner. So this will be on KLMS. Okay. So just check KLMS and see the video on your own time. Okay because we're running out of time. So, and there's one more topic I want to delve into, which is string theory. Okay, so what exactly is string theory? Um, so string theory basically states that all objects in our universe are composed of vibra vibrating filaments called strings. So typically we think of these particles, right? But the string theory says that there are these strings basically and membranes or, or short, in short brains of energy. So the whole string theory is created in order to reconcile two concepts, general relativity and quantum physics. But here's the problem, okay? So typically quantum physics and general relativity do not work very well together. They sort of contradict each other. And that has boggled a lot of scientists uh, into creating what we call the theory of everything, a simple explanation for the entire universe. And string theory, Seemed, seemed great for a while because it basically said there's like this connection between two types of particles, as we know, uh, called bosons and fermions. So uh, rather than just simple atoms, there are these different types of particles. Some people uh, postulate there's something called gravitons, et cetera, et cetera. And basically string theory was a good theory in order to reconcile these things. But more and more recently, string theory has been having problems reconciling, for example, dark energy, as we mentioned before. So it's a big, becoming a bit controversial and it's not really the greatest solution to everything. But the reason I wanted to bring it up was just so that you guys can learn about, um, again, the important bridging between the general relativity and quantum physics, as well as seeing how um, the universe is not really easy to explain. So it really brings into our question of, is there a theory of everything? Is there a law that can really state that everything is so simple. It is possible, but maybe not. Maybe it's not as easy as just saying, oh, this equation explains everything. And we're, of course, still limited by technology. And what happens if there is a multiverse? What happens then? So once again, it is very important that we have to reconcile a lot of different parts of different um, fields that we have learned. And I just want you guys to take that lesson from today's class. And I hope you guys really enjoyed this topic. Uh, I'm afraid that we didn't have a lot of time. But once again, I'm going to remind you guys that there will be a quiz next time. 
and for you to prepare for that, okay? Um, thank you for paying attention today. I hope you guys had fun and got more interested in astronomy. And I will see you guys next class. All right, and if you have any questions, just let me know. Okay. Oh, uh, I see one question actually. Um, will the quiz cover all of the topics today? Um, yes, actually, it will cover uh, Kepler's equations. It will not cover their relativity because that is technically a little bit optional. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.